I've been wanting to strip and repaint the windows for a while now. And I knew also the danger of lead paint. But I didn't stop and think how dangerous can be for Beto. My wife heard a story on the news that old paint can have lead in it. And lead can cause health problems for little kids. So now we're playing it safe and keeping Beto far away from my projects. While most common sources of lead exposure can include old pipes and even soil, the most prevalent source is lead-based paint. The paints that we use today around the house, for example, uh, do not have the high levels of lead that they used to many years ago. So it's the old paint that we're really concerned about, paint on windowsills and on woodwork and so on. Uh, and in this case on the, those chips which are old paint. Children are more susceptible to that type of thing because they eat lead paint or they le eat paint chips um, and they're also more susceptible because of the amount that they absorb relative to adults. They don't, adults don't absorb as much because of the pH of their stomachs. Uh, scientists have found that uh, kids who eat those chips uh, uh, have impaired uh, intelligence, lower IQs. And because of that, therefore, we're very concerned about uh, kids getting exposed to lead. Everything, including our bodies, is made up of chemicals. Chemicals are the building blocks of the world around us. We eat and drink chemicals to live. They're used to make clothes, computers, automobile parts, fuels, furniture, drugs, cosmetics, and to prepare and preserve foods. Chemicals are used in house cleaning supplies, gardening materials, and in keeping swimming pools and spas clean. Hazardous chemicals may be found almost anywhere. Paint cans, gasoline, old batteries around the house, household and industrial wastes at dump sites, or in polluted water and air. It's truly impossible to avoid chemicals, but it's vitally important to understand how they can affect each of us. It's hard to evaluate the effect of uh, chemicals um, uh, because different people have different sensitivities. Some people are more sensitive. Um, and it's difficult to predict for a whole population because there's variability within the population. People do not categorize all of the things that the toxicologists would categorize as a chemical. Many people just think of these are food, well, it's not a chemical, or lotion, that's not really chemicals. Those are good because otherwise they wouldn't be out there. So I think the awareness of what a chemical is is perhaps one place to start. People need to be aware of the chemicals they come into contact with each day and be equipped with an effective way to evaluate any potential risks and answer the question, is it safe? There are some chemicals for which people are exquisitely sensitive to, and there are some chemicals which are pretty toxic, and everybody, uh, it will show effects. Whether or not you're going to get adverse effects from a chemical depends on the properties of that chemical, what kind of effects it can produce, and it, it depends on the potency, how potent it is, it depends on how long you are exposed to that chemical, and it depends on your sensitivity to that particular uh, chemical, and it depends on how much enters the body. This basic concept of toxicology, known as the dose makes the poison, was developed nearly 400 years ago by a well-known physician known as Paracelsus. He recognized that low doses would sometimes do beneficial things, and as you push the dose up, eventually you got to the point where the dose, in fact, was producing bad, uh, bad things. So he made that statement, the dose made the poison, and toxicologists adopted that as our motto. If you take a fraction of a dose of aspirin, for example, it isn't going to really do a lot to your system. Uh, if you have a headache and take several aspirins, uh, it will probably alleviate your headache. If you increase the number of aspirin you take, say you take 100 aspirin, for example, then you're in the range where it is likely to produce uh, injury. So as you increase the dose, you increase the likelihood that that chemical is going to produce a harmful effect in your system. So what you need to know is what kind of harm it's going to produce and what dose is required to produce that harm. An example of a potentially harmful dosage can be found in something we're all familiar with, vitamin A. Vitamin A or retinol 
commonly occurs in, in uh, vegetables, it occurs in fruits, it occurs in fish. It can be formed from beta carotene, and beta carotene is an orange material. It's what gives the orange color to squash and to carrots. Retinol, uh, as vitamin A, of course, is essential. We need that in order uh, for our function. But high doses of retinol cause uh, central nervous system damage, and particularly in children. Sometimes, chemical toxicity depends on differences in people. People come in different sizes, ages, weight, genetic makeup, and general health. What may be toxic for a small child, for example, may not be harmful to a large, healthy adult. Size is one factor that makes a child's response to a chemical different from that of an adult. What we're going to do is add a couple drops of uh, dye uh, to the small beaker representing the child and then the same amount of material to the large beaker representing the adult to see if we can see a difference. So I'll add two drops of this dye to the small beaker and two drops to the large beaker. Okay, same amount of material in both beakers. You can see there's a fair amount of color there. But you can see that the color in the beaker representing the child is stronger than the color in the adult. That's one reason why children are more sensitive than adults. The dose is actually what gets into your body or that gets applied at the interface of the skin if you're talking about skin toxicity. Or let's say it causes uh, lung damage. Uh, if you inhale it, then you're going to get a fair dose just by inhaling it. But if the chemical is one that affects the reproductive system or the heart or something else, it has to travel to those organs in order to cause the problem. Another example of a toxic substance can be found in the air we breathe. Well, the first time I had an asthma attack, I had no idea what caused it. It wasn't until later I figured out it was the air itself, the ozone in the air, that was giving me trouble. The ozone in the, the atmosphere prevents uh, the, sun, the ultraviolet rays of the sun from getting to us, and that, of course, causes cancer, melanoma. Uh, so we like that effect. Uh, however,